All right, welcome to the Under the Hood show from Barrett Jackson. We are very happy to be here. Shannon Nordstrom is here. Welcome, hoodies. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up yeah, you from Barrett Jackson. You can't leave me hanging on that one, Can man. you give me a little more volume in my headset or I not? I can, right here. Yeah, I could, right use, I could use a little. Yeah, that's probably a little too much, but All that's right. about right. You're always such a complainer. I don't try to be. I'm, I think people that know me think I'm a pretty easy guy to get along with. Yeah, we all agreed to uh, just say that, though. I mean, a few years ago, we were like, we should just pretend that. There it is. It was we debatable. Now. Something yeah. just happened. Russ yeah. found the magic button. It was, oh, just yeah. pushed it right in the yeah. middle. Right in the middle. <laughs> we are live here at Barrett Jackson. It is a fantastic opportunity and an honor to be here. It really is cool to be here and see this live after seeing it on TV for so long and seeing all that. It's very cool to be able to be a part of it. And behind us, we have a whole room full of Berkeley One Guess the Color Classics. Uh, right. You I can't see them, so guess. We could guess what? the color, and there's a lot of different colors back there, every color yeah. under the rainbow. And we got to thank our friends from Berkeley One Classics for making this possible that we're here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, they've went out of their way to make sure that we had a place to be on stage and an opportunity to be able to get some interviews that hopefully will happen today. Uh, this is a live event, so we're here with the engine running, literally. And, and yeah. so we're going to be pulling some people it aside smooth. to do this. It so just, everything went well, and we <laughs> got everything good. It was great. Yeah, I mean, Russ and uh, Chris were here early getting things set up. And, and, of course, with three minutes to spare, they got it all figured mm -hmm. out. So I think here I see uh, Craig Jackson headed this way. Yeah, that's <laughs> our uh, that's our first item of business. we got to keep that man moving. Yep. I think it, <laughs> it does seem like a, this does seem like a terrible time to have... Craig on the show to to do this. So this is uh, quite an honor. Craig Jackson. Out. Oh, well, that's more than we figured. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Craig Jackson, thank you very much for joining us. It is an honor to have you on the show. And it has been an amazing couple days already to be here and see what you guys are doing here at Scottsdale. Tell us just quick, this is kind of a, a new situation for Barrett Jackson, right? This is the first one of the of the fall. It is. Well, fall we did coming out of covid our first auction back was here in october about okay. the same week and uh we chose that because the weather is normally so cool we <laughs> left all the sidewalls off all the tents for open air and uh that allowed the city and everybody to sign off on coming back to live events people loved it and asking them what they would like what city they'd like go to a lot of my customers so let's go back to scottsdale so that's how we ended up here, and uh, we were going to leave all the big tents up. We built all the infrastructure, and uh, we're going to, as we say, Scott's still so nice, we decided to do it twice. <laughs> that is, comes from my wife. That is her tagline. She so. nailed it, because that's perfect. <laughs> and the thing that I've, the most amazing part I've, uh, I've, in addition to the cars is, there must be over a thousand people working this event, and to the person at the the people around the auction, the people in the parking lot, everyone I've run into seems like they are happy to be here, proud to be here, and this is important to them too. Everybody I've run into, it feels like they're they're just a major cog in this machine. They're so great to work with. Oh, well, th thank you for that. Uh, that is part of the way that we. You know, we go to different events, and you want your event to be where from the person that's directing traffic to the people taking tickets to security guards. It's about training. It's about attitude. But our core staff, I got to give the credit to training everybody. We go from a staff of 110 to a staff of 800. So you have to train everybody in the way we want customers feel, but they also have to be educated in the handbook that we hand out to everybody, teaching them how all their jobs work. It's and working. It's, and that's why we felt a little rusty because we did not do an auction over the summer. So the first few days were like, all right, we all got to get back in <laughs> sync again. Yeah. So we're used to doing it every 90 days, and it's muscle memory. It came back. Muscle car memory. <laughs> Muscle car <Hey>. memory. <laughs> so yeah, I, I know a lot of our listeners, they, of course, many people know Barrett Jackson. But I found out a little more recently, and I was pretty excited about it because I've been a car builder in the past. And currently I'm not building cars, but I'm working on them every day in our shop, repairing them, and Shannon's working with recycling. But you yourself, you're a car collector, and you're a, a racer of cars, but... All those cars in the collection, 
you can work on them hands-on. You're actually a, a builder. Well, I, that's where I grew up. So I grew up in the shop. And uh, as I say, I was my brother's apprentice, which means <laughs> I worked cheap and I got all the bad <laughs> jobs. So I learned the art of steam cleaning, sandblasting, picking and filing, <laughs> buffing out aluminum oh and stainless steel. So not the glamorous jobs. And uh, I, I learned from a lot of guys that were in their 70s and 80s how to roll metal, pick and file, lead. So we still have a full shop under my office is our shop. So for me, when I want to take a break, I go down and we work on the cars. I'm constantly building cars for our build series, which is on YouTube. Right now, um, I'm doing a 37 Bugatti, my van that I've owned since 1978 that I put 400,000 miles on and customized. That's I'm restoring great. my van. Uh, back to the way it was, but it, it now has an LS engine in it, so it's a little bit perkier than it was. We need but, to talk. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I also bought back the first car my parents ever bought here at the auction, and uh, bought that in 17, tore it apart, and realized how, why they found it in a junkyard. <laughs> uh, it needed all new wood in the lower extremities. They had led it over when they restored it in the 60s all the rusted out areas. So we reformed a lot of uh, metal, took the skins off, made new lower parts of all the skins because the car was from Michigan. Salt got back into everywhere. What was that vehicle, Craig? It's a 1934 Cadillac uh, V12 Opera Coupe, 154 inch wheelbase. And my mother actually drove it from Michigan to Arizona when they moved. So she was uh, quite a car person, five foot four, driving that uh, manual transmission uh, Cadillac cross country. So it meant so much, I wanted to buy it back. So I restored that. We're doing a, Dalla, or a Type 57 Bugatti that I actually bought here at the auction last year. Beautiful car, started driving it, leaked like a sieve. <laughs> so I decided, all right, let's pull the engine out, reseal it, and one thing leads to another. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm powder coating the frame. So <laughs> it just starts that way. It all, the, and the Cadillac started, it blew a radiator out, and you had to take the whole doghouse off the front of the car to get the radiator out. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going, yeah, I'm not putting this back together like this. So we might as well yank the engine. Once we did that, we got the body, and then we're powder coating the frame. So that's always how it ends. When you growing up in a shop and you get something, you're like, I'm not going to do it halfway. We're going to do it. Let's just do it. Then I, uh, it's done for life. And then the next car we're building is my Pontiac, which was my first driving car. So my grandmother gave me that car in 1975 and bef when I was 15 years old. So I hot rodded it through between my freshman and sophomore year in high school, drove it my sophomore year in high school, and blew it up drag racing it. <laughs> So then I parked it, and it was intended on putting a new engine in it, bought a couple of different uh, Pontiac engines, a Ram Air 4, 400, a Super Duty, and never worked on the car. So now we sent it to the Roadster shop in collaboration with the Roadster shop. They built a custom uh, chassis for it. I said, I want it to look like my high school car, put an IRS under the rear of it, put an LT4 in the front of it with a 10-speed automatic, and I said, I want it all to fit under the flat hood. And when I'm done, I want to take a picture and put it next to the picture when I drove it in high school. It looks the same, but it'll have a whole lot of new technology in it. So we build resto mods. We restore cars to take to Pebble Beach. But uh, a lot of the cars I'm building now are cars that mean something. I'm so glad to hear you say that, that you have one plan, you take out the... You open the hood and then a whole plan develops after that. I'm going to save that for my wife because she always wonders why I did something different than I was going to. And I, it just happens. It's it, not. It, it happened. You start unraveling the sweater yeah. with a little pull on this. And all of a sudden you're like, all right, well, we might as well, if we're in here, fix <laughs> yeah, it. Exactly. It happens on home remodels. You know, I started with the bathroom. Next thing I know, I'm moving up. out. <laughs> if we have a different house. Yeah, exactly. I, we love the way that you're you're keeping the hobby up and the interest too, Craig, because w with a lot of our listeners, we've heard people say, oh, you're going to Barrett Jackson? Well, I don't have the money to buy a, you know, a $100,000 car. And we say, no, 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 no. Have, have you really looked? Because 
yesterday we watched cars go here. We saw some really cool stuff that would have been a perfect father-son project for less than 10,000 bucks. Yeah. Right. And nice stuff. And we do that intentionally. When we first went on Speed Vision back in 96, we only did three hours primetime Friday, three hours primetime Saturday. And we did that for a few years with Speed. They kept growing them, but they only did primetime at the expensive car. And I started hearing that. Well, I can't come to Barrett Jackson. All you sell is, you know, and this 30 years ago, $100,000 car with a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, so then we worked with Speed and started showing the whole week. And the whole emphasis was you need to get into car collecting. You don't have to be rich if you want to work on a car yourself. That's why we also have all the automotive vendors here. Uh, my goal in developing this was you can come here, you can buy a car done, you can buy a project, you have a wealth of knowledge of vendors here to help yeah. you through the process. And uh, that's why we do seminars and teach people about how to get into car collecting. And the other thing I think that's important is the way we sell the cars and our experts and our team vetting the car. Not every car needs to be a numbers matching car. In fact, now you got so many resto mods, but the car needs to be as described. And that's mm. being from a car background and a whole team of car people around me that help vet the cars and making sure that the description is what the car is. Yeah, this is a tribute. We know this when you see yeah, it. It's, it. It's a tribute, it, it, whatever's been done. But now we also have two guys that help me, uh, that have done work for me. Almost all the experts have also helped me in my personal car collection. So I know their ethics and what they look for and have helped me restore cars, especially Billups, who helped me restore Little Red, Green Hornet, some iconic Shelbys that are in my collection. But they, their ethics and their, their knowledge to look at cars. And I think a lot of guys that build, let's call it, unofficial clones, um, don't bring them here because we know what we're looking at. You'll tell the truth on it and show uh -huh. them. Yeah, we you. have a tent in the back. We have two lifts, and if we suspect a car... Uh, it's got something done to it that's not described. We take it out there, put it on the lift. And, that's, I did not know that. And dig into it, and then we come back and tell you, yeah, it's a rebody. Updated description. I've yeah. Up seen that, yeah. <laughs> uh, time for the updated description. And a lot of times the guy that bought the car doesn't know it. I mean, we have to be the bearer mm. of bad news. Right. We look at, and, but on the front side, we ask for pictures of trim tags, numbers, uh, VIN tags, just to make sure as much as we can up front. And because we get 40% new buyers at every auction, we want them to feel confident. We're not guaranteeing the cars. You know, we can't go and tear every car apart. But we try to make sure that the car makes sense. And then we have a whole property room outside, which I was giving a tour to yesterday, that if you say it comes with all the books, records, trophies, spare top, when you check it in, if it doesn't have it, it comes off comes the off, description. Yeah. And we have a whole tent full of hard tops and spare wheels, spare engines, everything that comes with the car. So. I loved that yesterday when, when the, at the early part of the day, when the cars were going for, they were just, they weren't million dollar cars. The bidders were still treated like they were on Saturday night buying a million dollar car. That was the, the fun of buying a car here starts at the bottom and goes all the way to the final car that goes well, for the it, highest price. It should be. It, you, you know, as we say, small fish become large fish. You get yeah. into it, you drive a car, you bring it back, you sell it, you buy another car, and we encourage people to do that. Uh, you know, people, I, I advise them, buy what you're passionate about, but understand the use of the car at the same time. And I've sold high-end muscle cars to guys, and they drive them and go, man, this thing handles horribly. I'll drive it and go, it actually handles very good for a 1970. Yeah. <laughs> you may be a resto mod guy. You right. like the look of that car, but you want it to drive like your brand new car. You need an Art Morrison or a Roadster Shop chassis under it. You need better technology and all the creature comforts. And I think that's why you see the incredible rise of the resto mods across all platforms of cars. They're, I just did a tour through the salon of all the all the trucks that are resto modded that are absolutely incredible uh the workmanship that has been done to make them uh they you could still take them out in four-wheel drive them if you want but they would run and drive like a brand new truck 
That is, a, well, you, you're talking about the cars that you've had. Oh. This has been a family thing for you from the beginning. And you mentioned Little Red and the Green Hornet. Talk a little bit about that. Those are s such amazing stories and, and backstories on those cars. Yeah, I'll make it quick. So both those cars, in fact, I have three of the cars that were supposed to be crushed now because I bought the other Conlig car. Uh, back in the day, the auto manufacturers, when they made a prototype, the protocol was crush it because it didn't meet the rules. <laughs> well, Steve Davis, decades ago, they found the Green Hornet and it was hiding in plain sight. I actually drove it to, gave it to his son, drove it through college, still said EXP 500 on the side of it. There were books written and the car was found, discovered and uh, validated that it was the Green Hornet. And what was the Green Hornet? Well, it was the second car. The first iconic car was Little Red and it, everybody knew, was crushed. Absolutely, definitively, it was crushed. Um, after we started restoring the Green Hornet, that's when we started to look for Little Red. But look, Little Red was, when, they, when Carroll came back for winning Le Mans in 66, he decided he wanted to build GT500s. So he built three cars, a coupe, a convertible, and a, a hardtop notchback. And that's what ended up. And they were all 428 uh, Cobra jets with air conditioning. So they didn't make 428 Cobra jets with air conditioning. So the cars started off very unique. And then Little Red he used as a development car throughout its life. And he had, first thing he did is put two blowers on it. Because he, and he, some of the myths were wrong that he painted it Ferrari Red. Once we found the car, we knew that myth was wrong. But he made it to go out and eat Ferraris on the street. That was his <laughs> goal after just winning Le Mans. Uh, they didn't end up building them, but then that car, we didn't know it, kept getting updated through its history. And as all the Shelby guys worked together to share information. So we hunted that car down uh, when we were doing the research for the Green Hornet, finding the VIN number for that car, ran it through the national database, got a hit and uh, found the guy on Facebook. And when Billups called him, <laughs> he, he goes, it's Little Red, isn't it? You think it's Little Red? He had actually called SAC and they told him it was crushed. But he called SAC, told him he had a 68 Shelby because it was a 68 at the end of life. So they never made a 68 Shelby coupe. Green Hornet evolved from Little Red then, was sh shipped to Dearborn to uh, for, uh, uh, the deuce to see the car and they decided to build the California special and it is the father of the California special it had later life well the and I'll make this story as short as I can it was pretty interesting they decided then the next year they wanted to build a nationwide version of the California special so they built a prototype in Dearborn and that car when they decided not to do it they gave it to Shelby Automotive because Shelby America in California, but shut down, moved to Michigan. And then that car they gave to Shelby, went to Ford Advanced Vehicles, who was doing all the work on the GT40s, put an independent rear suspension in it, Conlig fuel injection, which was computerized fuel injection. So a computer running a car in 1968 with a potentiometer, <laughs> you can change the richness, wow. the idle on it. <laughs> uh, way ahead of its time, had the same transmission they had developed for Little Red put into it. And then Shelby Automotive painted it, Sonny Fee, who came to Michigan, who was their painter, painted it candy apple green. And that's the way the car was found. They actually sold it off a Ford lot. They took the independent rear suspension and also had four-wheel disc brakes. So it had a lot of innovation of its time. When we restored the car, we went to all the people that had either built the car or their sons and got them to help us restore the car. Oh, that's, that's awesome. That's and cool. And I did two series on it for History Channel, uh, The Hunt for Little Red and uh, The Green Hornet, and they're on my YouTube and Barrett Jackson's YouTube channel. Uh, the first cut was an hour and a half on each one because there was so much stuff <laughs> to go into. But having the original blueprints, hunting down the original parts for the IRS, uh, and actually getting a lot of the original parts back on the car was absolutely amazing. It's still fun, isn't it? Even, I mean, big picture, we've got this whole thing, but each car that comes across and each car that, it's still fun. And to see that, the 
the way you're telling this story, someone else is telling that story right now about a car they bought yesterday. Mm. That's the coolest part about this whole thing, I think. It is. You know what I loved about restoring these two cars was getting the kids. Uh, we actually found the gentleman through social media. We did crowdsourcing when I unveiled Little Red. And we got on our Facebook and we had a uh, shelbycoops.com uh, website. And this one gentleman went on the website and said, my dad said the car was crushed. All right. Then he finally <laughs> showed the pictures to his dad. And he goes, that's Little Red. There was a lot of things that were very unique about it. And uh, make a long story short, he actually moved to Arizona. So I reunited him with the car, oh, wow. and he gave me pictures that nobody had ever seen of the car back in the day. And that's how we decided where to build it and how to build it through interviewing him and having the photographs of the car back in the day with both blowers on it saying EXP 500. Interviewing all the living Shelby guys then became a a quest of mine and what was it like in the shop and then when we sold uh, a couple of years ago when we came out of COVID uh, the super snake Cobra for the first time same thing happened guy called said you know I built that car and his story and the guy that built Little Red if you put them both like a detective in two separate rooms and interviewed them their stories were identical Carol said Put it in the corner. Don't tell the four guys what you're doing. And <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> go to parts. Get the parts. If they ask you any questions, don't answer any questions. Tell them you're working on a project for me. And hearing that story from both, and these were both Carol's personal cars: the little red with the two blowers and the super snake with little blo with blowers on it. I love the fact that that uh, story. When someone's selling a car, too, you got. I, I've noticed that the you guys, the staff here, you treat each car that if I'm selling a car, you give it that important. It's, if it's important to me and I'm selling that car, you guys realize that and help me. Well, as we say, these are people's babies. Yeah. And you may have a car that's been in the family for 50 years and it's emotional to sell it. You may have built the car yourself. And that's why we treat the cars the way we want our cars treated. Yeah, it is, it's so cool to see. And when they roll across, it is just, when, to see people excited to bid and when they get it, it's, it's so much fun to be in that room and see that happen or watch it on TV. It's not quite the same. It is no, a, it people is a, come here all the time and say, I had no idea, a, especially January Scottsdale, but we have all the big tents up, so mm -hmm. it's pretty much the same, that it's much more than just an auction, but the auction action inside, especially when we hit Saturday tomorrow, will be just like Scottsdale, the quality of cars, uh, selling Sammy Hagar's Law Ferrari tomorrow with him here up on the auction block and Melo Alvarez's 2018 Bugatti Chiron. Today we're selling William Shatner's Jaguar. So just left Captain Kirk a few minutes ago and <laughs> he'll be up on the block. Uh, celebrities, uh, their cars, but the common part is they love cars. Right. Both Camelo and Sammy spec their cars from brand new. What's, uh, what else is going up tomorrow? There's got to be a few that are on your ra radar. Not the big celebrity, maybe. Maybe somewhere not towards the end of the night. But what's going up tomorrow that you, you've noticed and we're like, mm. I like the white Viper in there. I kicked myself for not ordering one in 17 because I ordered a, my first new car I still have was a, two th was a 1997 Viper Roadster. And I still have it. And uh, when they ended, uh, you know, after the orders were done, I was like, yeah, I probably should have ordered one. And I was like, eh, do I need another Viper? But when I walked by that, I was like, yeah, that's probably how I would expect it. <laughs> have you ever, is there anything that has rolled across that you've just f couldn't, couldn't let go and you, you bought it? There's been a there? couple. My uh -huh. rule is I go off the auction block, I go down, I stand there and buy it. Uh, I've bought a few cars on the auction block. I bought a uh, charity car, the first VIN 1 GT500. That was sort of spontaneous. And when Edsel <laughs> Ford was- It happens. It happens. <laughs> and it all went to a good cause, uh, but they built me a very cool car. So, and the reason I bought that VIN 1, one uh, juvenile diabetes, been a big, uh, we've been a big supporter. I think we've raised 6.8 or $7 million for him. Good job. Um, but also when Edsel told the story, I don't know, of all the new things in it, and I'm standing there thinking, well, it's got supercharger, like Little Red. It's got computerized fuel injection, like Hornet. It's got IRS under it. 
all those things came together in the 2020 that were pioneered back with Little Red and the Green Hornet. So <laughs> after I bid on it, I was showing the Green Hornet there and I leaned over to Edsel and we're doing the photos. I go, I want to paint it like that car. And the plant manager just puts his head <laughs> down. <laughs> Edsel says, whatever you want. And I had, so I got to go back to the factory, watch him build it, but he told me, what a pain it was for them to do it. And I had no idea when I made the request, they had to take the body, put it together, send it to Penske to paint it, make it just like the Green Hornet, bring it back, disassemble it, put it in the racks. Because my car actually wasn't just VIN 1. A lot of times they'll make their pre-productions and they'll start making some cars where VIN 1. This was the first car down the line. And they, it had to be right. And so I, I watched them build it at Flat Rock. We brought the Green Hornet back there, put it in the lobby. After they fired it up, we drove it around and put it in the lobby and had both cars sitting there looking 50 years apart. Well, as a, a t t truly, a, I was not a car person just a few years ago, and I don't even know if I am now. First timer here. It's such a fun event, whether you're buying cars or into them or not. It is, yeah. this is well done. Now, the, all the vendors, it's the atmosphere here. It is an automotive mm -hmm. lifestyle event. It is not just an auction. We kicked it off with our party under the stars the other night. We were there. We had a good time. It was yeah, a great it was party. great. Now, once the sun goes down here, it's wonderful. A little, little hotter than we had anticipated, but we have 750,000 <laughs> square feet. Every car selling from now on is indoors. So... People it, should come out and take advantage of really Barrett Jackson here. What a fun time. Thanks for, I know you have to go. You, you are busy this weekend, so I know you yeah, have to I go. Yeah, I got a day job. <laughs> I, but cars are my passion. I love them. I love the people that collect them. Race, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, a founding member of a track out here. I love tracking cars. And uh, I just love the whole lifestyle of it and uh, love going on road rallies and just the camaraderie. And that's what you find at Barrett Jackson. I get to do this for like the first time on the End of the Hood Show. Can we get a round of applause for our guest, Craig Jackson? Thanks so much for coming. I know Thank you, you. got to go do opening ceremonies. So thanks so much. Kick it off. Thank, Thank you. you very much.